everyone, Arlisha here and welcome to another video. It's time for a new limited palette video and this is a specific limited palette that has been requested lots of times since I started doing this series and I've kind of been waiting to do it and I'm really excited to bring it to you today. So we are going to be exploring the Zorn palette which was made famous by the painter Anders Zorn, who traditionally painted in oil paints in the late 19th and early 20th century. He was known for using these technically four colors in oil paints, being a yellow ochre, a vermilion red, which is also sometimes thought to have been like a cadmium red or cadmium red light, ivory black, and white. So I had to make a couple little adjustments as I wanted to use gouache for this, not oil paints. And my range of colors is a little bit more limited when it comes to gouache, but I thought it would be fun to do this in an opaque medium because the inclusion of titanium white specifically is really important for this palette. And I don't think we've actually done a limited palette video in gouache before. This is the first one. I think the most notable feature about this palette is the fact that there is no blue. Now, even if Anders Zorn was known for using this particular palette, it doesn't necessarily mean it was the only thing he ever did, but it was a range of colors that he absolutely mastered and is very well known for. What I love about these colors is because there is no blue, the combination of ivory black and titanium white is acting as now our, well, as close as we're going to get to blue. And I think that when that balance is properly struck, it's a beautiful thing and really captures the heart of why limited palettes are so amazing because we start to talk about relative colors instead of like actual true colors. And what I mean by that is that we're reading the colors according to their relationship to other colors, what they're near, what's around them, and how they look. And we're thinking more in terms of temperature and how all of the colors work together than the straight color itself. So there is no blue in this palette, but we still have cooler tones in the form of that light gray. And when properly placed next to the really, really saturated red, and we can even get some really earthy green tones when we mix the yellow ochre and the ivory black, and there's a lot of range in there when you add in the white. There's something so sturdy and grounded about this palette that's hard for me to put my finger on in terms of describing it to you. I often feel like blue, the way that I use it, especially like a phthalo blue, provides a sort of ethereal floating quality to a color palette, and exchanging that for something so solid and definitive like an ivory black. It just feels like such an intentional, beautiful change to make. I remember early on when I was first learning about art, specifically, I think this applies a little bit more to watercolors, I was hearing a lot and kind of got into my head that the two colors that I would never need to use, specifically in watercolors, were white and black. And you don't want white in watercolors because you want to use the transparency of the page, which is something, a rule that, a quote unquote rule that I do break sometimes now, because some of my favorite watercolor colors have white mixed into them and then you don't want to use black because it's better to mix your own black and you get like a richer color that way and i think in some cases that's true but i think by completely omitting black specifically there's a whole range of color mixes that may not be otherwise explored and having just straight standard strong blacks to mix into a color palette feels like an opportunity that doesn't need to be just straight up overlooked or forgotten or ignored this is probably a good moment to jump in and apologize for any noise you may be hearing. There is an, a new ongoing saga across the street from our house and they're, they're building a house right across the street. It's been an open field and now there's going to be a house. Oh my word. So for a little while now, there's going to be some noise. I'll do my best to record voiceovers at a time when it's quiet. Either way, thank you for your patience and understanding. I've completely lost track of what I was saying prior to that but I really loved the early stages of this painting in particular. 
it was one of those moments where I'm actually like feeling a little bit angry about how well a painting's going in the beginning because they don't all go that way. Like I feel like I can so clearly see maybe three or four steps ahead, you know, in the painting where I, I go, yep, I know what I'm doing next. And then I know what I'm doing after that. And I can just see it and it flows and I can feel how I want to transition the colors and what values I want to put where, especially, which this is something I didn't mention ahead of time with this painting. This is the first time since I can remember, like since a painting I did the painting that was called Dream of You, where I, it was a watercolor making video where I made the color ultramarine rose and I did that painting and I talked about how, I think I talked a little bit how I wasn't really using a reference and I had a couple images like one was a stylistic reference and one was a color reference or maybe a pose and that's not something I do very often. I usually have like a more solid base of reference images and with this painting I had no references and that I, I can't even say why I did that or what led to that, but I had an idea of what I wanted in my head and it felt strong enough to go on. And I was hoping that it would be a fun exploration and leaning on rendering features in a way that just felt good instead of trying to render what I saw in reference images. I just wanted to explore, you know, a bit more... I don't want to say naturally or organically because using reference images is still a really important part of my process, but I just wanted to see the painting as a series of shapes and put them all together as opposed to the very different feeling process of communicating what you see in a reference image or in a series of reference images. I was really surprised then by how well this painting turned out as I was super nervous, but it flowed really nicely. And I'm really, really, well, I say really, really, I'm probably 90, 93% happy with this painting. It's especially painful for me looking back on even this stage of the painting, this earlier stage, where I'm looking at it going, oh man, I really like how it looks right now. And sometimes I can see a clear turning point where I go, yes, this is the step that I took that I wish I hadn't taken, and this is what pushed the painting in a direction that I didn't like as much. But it's harder with this one to see that moment and try to identify it. I think I did like when the overall skin tone had less of the yellow ochre in it. There was a little bit of yellow mixed in with some of the more purpley values and even some of the red just to shift the hue a bit. And I do like the greener yellow values down in like the neck and shoulder and chest area. But I think I liked the face more when it had less of the yellow. Another thing that I forgot to mention when it happened was I worked on this painting over two separate days. You may have seen when I made this change and when I came back to it the second day it was so clear to me that the mouth was like way too high. So it was actually really nice having an opaque medium where I could just come in, scrub out some of that paint and just paint right over it and move the mouth down. So that was really nice and I was way more satisfied with it afterwards. I am a huge fan of this color palette. Like I said, there's something so grounding about using straight black. It also feels like a little bit of a rebellious thing because in my brain I always thought, oh, don't just put, you know, straight black onto your painting. But now I'm just, I love it so much. And every time I do, I feel like a little bit of rebellious glee partly in going, aha, look, I'm doing this thing that I thought I wasn't supposed to do, but also it's actually just good and it's actually just fun and there's actually, you know, nothing wrong with doing it that way. So it's been fun and I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to explore that. Another really fun thing about the experience of working with this painting was that it's actually been quite a while since I've worked with fresh gouache out of a tube. I've been using the jelly gouache a lot and getting to work with like most of these colors are like higher quality m gram watercolors except for the red which is from arteza it's still really nice and it felt so different there's something about like I'll, I'll say i'll use the term traditional gouache that has more of like a milkiness to it and when i was really used to using the jelly gouache and i would come back to something like this it felt so weird 
you know, to use like traditional gouache, that milkiness was something that started to feel a little foreign, but now I just love it so much. And I'm really glad that I've had opportunities with gouache in different forms and like formulations because it helps me to better blur the line between how I work with gouache and how I work with watercolors because these traditional gouache tubes do feel a little bit more like watercolors than like a jelly gouache, for example. That consistency is just different enough. So I'm able to sort of cross boundaries and like cross the streams of things where I go, this is what you do with gouache and this is what you do with watercolors. So with this painting, I did a lot more blending and like working wet into wet with my gouache, which is not something that I always do. And it was really, really fun. And I specifically, even in a couple places, which you'll see closer to the end of the painting, I relied in some areas on being able to blend out the edges of my gouache to get a softness to create a sort of glowing effect. And I think it was really effective. I'm really happy with how it looks. As far as my plans go for this finished painting, the original will be for sale in my shop. I will have prints available there as well, and patrons already have access to this painting as this month's high resolution digital download. So like I've said before, this is another one of those paintings that there's lots of ways to enjoy if you're interested in supporting me further. Thank you. 
As I got closer and closer to the end of this painting, there was something about the face, specifically like the cheekbones, that was really bothering me. I felt like they just slowly got wider and wider from the original sketch, which I really loved the flow of the facial structure in the original sketch, so I was kind of sad to lose that. And I could not, for the longest time, put my finger on what it was about the painted face that I disliked. And then it hit me while I was like thinking about it overnight that the highlighted cheekbones was just giving a little bit too much handsome Squidward, if you know what I mean. Like it's just, he was a little too glowy and a little too cheekbony. I, I mean, in some instances that can be really cool, but handsome Squidward was not the vibe for today. So I actually ended up filming this entire painting process, editing the entire video, and realizing that that's what the problem was, and you'll see it at the end of this, I went back to the finished painting. I had already peeled the tape and everything, and I took off the Handsome Squidward filter. Just wasn't working for this one. Another absolutely invaluable tool in the process of creating this painting was taking pictures along the way and putting the pictures into black and white. I've talked about this before, but it's so helpful for seeing the values of the painting and then understanding better what I need to do to finish it so I can better see the full value range and then I can make decisions about what needs to be lighter, what needs to be darker, if I need to create more like distinct variety between particular ideas. Now in terms of what I did here, which was I took a picture and then thought that there was too much of a very light value near the top of the head, like where the, like that was running off the page. So I wanted the lighter values to be more centered towards the middle and draw in towards the face instead of those super light values running right off the top of the page. And ultimately, I think I actually liked the hair a little bit better before I made the change. And then it just kind of started to feel like the hair was a bunch of shapes that weren't really connected. It's a look that I like it, in, in terms of like it's kind of messy and rough, which those features on paper are a good thing, but I don't think it was executed well enough in working on this painting to be exactly what I was looking for. So even though you're seeing me right now peel the tape, I am peeling the tape, but I'm coming back to it because this painting's not done. <laughs> I peeled the tape and then I was like, wait a minute, no, something's not right. Peeled the tape, edited the whole video, and then came back to it. And I think part of the reason why that highlight was even there, because I originally intended to make it look like there was a backlight from just one side, but then I added this sort of ring, this glowing ring of light. Oh no, is this whole thing like, um, like an Instagram reel or a TikTok? Like how infiltrated is my brain? I don't even use TikTok and like the subconscious messaging of this painting feels like beauty filters and ring lights. I swear that was not intentional and I have not thought about it. The metaphor fits a little bit, but I did go back and like take it off <laughs> in the end, I guess. So that's helpful, please. Please don't remember this painting that way. Oh no, oh no. Now I'm gonna have to spend a while building some other mental narrative so that that's not what's happening in this painting. I do really like the glowing ring though and I'm totally doing that more with gouache because it's so effective and so easy to achieve. It's so satisfying, like watching those milky edges bleed out. I love it. okay, this painting is done for real. To be honest, I'm actually really grateful for the fact that I went back several times and did little tweaks and made little changes because I'm slowly like getting more patient with my art and allowing it to take time because really 
the thought of going back and making changes is more work than actually just going back and doing it most of the time for me. As always, a huge thank you to my members here on YouTube and my patrons over on Patreon. I'm so grateful for all of your support. Like I mentioned earlier, this painting will be available on my shop, the original as well as prints. And thank you for watching this video. I'll talk to you next week. Okay, bye bye.